All right. Well, hello and good morning, everyone. I could not be more excited to welcome you to a very special event launching the Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity. My name is Amani Augustus, and I serve as the director of this alliance, which is a new program formed by the National Urban League and Third Way. These two organizations have come together to answer one vital question. How do we ensure more women and minorities can start and scale successful businesses? Entrepreneurship is one of the greatest tools we have to building wealth in our country, yet just 2% of employer businesses are black owned and just 6% of Hispanic business or Hispanic are um, Hispanic owned. Men actually outnumber women three to one in business ownership. These communities are growing and becoming increasingly important to our economy. And in an environment where the racial wealth gap continues to widen, we must consider the barriers these ind individuals face in building successful companies. The Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity exists to close this gap and dramatically increase the opportunity that disadvantaged entrepreneurs have to find success at all stages of business. Today, we have two exciting conversations planned for you. We are honored to be joined by Congresswoman Sharice Davids, representing the third congressional district of Kansas. She'll be joined by my colleague and senior vice president for Third Way's economic program, Gabe Horwitz. Together, they will discuss how to expand entrepreneurial opportunity to all communities in a bold and thoughtful way. Later, you'll see me again as I convene a phenomenal panel of women who are entrepreneurs, advocates, and experts on this issue to discuss what an agenda focused on entrepreneurial equity looks like. Now, it is my pleasure to hand things over to my friend, Gabe. Amani, thank you so much. Um, I, am too, am really excited to spend some time this morning with Congresswoman Davids. You know, for those that don't know, um, the Congresswoman was elected in 2018. Her district includes Kansas City on the Kansas side. Among her many committee assignments, she's a subcommittee chair on the Small Business Committee. And also, fun fact I just read about, she has competed professionally in mixed martial arts. So we're going to be very nice today. I'm going to ask very nice questions, but let's let's dive in. I got and nervous. I got nervous when you said you just found out something. I, you all, yeah, I should have specified. It's a good thing. It's this, it's um, good. Let's start um, really at 30,000 feet. And I want to get a sense of the landscape outside of this DC bubble that so many of us get trapped in. You're constantly meeting with constituents back home. I was just reading about this really interesting tour you did, this Made in Kansas tour a couple of weeks ago. So I'm just curious, what are you hearing from people back home? What are you hearing from people who own businesses or who want to own businesses? How are they feeling? What are they concerned about? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, there's a couple of things, first of all, that I would say. Well, actually, thank you for uh, for putting this uh, conversation on for um, focusing on these issues, because I think that uh, especially, and we'll get into kind of some of the work that I've been doing, but um, from the conversations that I've been having with folks back home, uh, whether it was the Made in Kansas tour, which I think is the one you're talking about, yeah. or, um, you know, I did a, it was small business week, not that long ago. And I got a chance to visit with a number of small businesses in uh, in Mission, Kansas, or the, in the Kansas Third. And I think across the board, the issues that people are facing, you know, supply chain issues, which you know, I'm hoping that the work we've done already, whether it's through the American Rescue Plan or the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, will help to unstick the supply chains and then um, and then workforce issues like these are um, some of the biggest issues that I heard about, particularly for the much smaller businesses um, was I think I talked to two companies just in the last three weeks that could grow, but they don't have uh, they don't have the workforce um, and are hard, having a hard time uh, finding folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that those are probably two of two of the bigger things. And then the last thing, which maybe actually is the biggest um, uh, kind of issue or concern that folks are dealing with is um, the, co the costs 
And whether that's uh, shipping costs, which are part of the supply chain issues, whether it's rising gas prices um, with the global volatility we're seeing right now, uh, things are just getting more expensive. And that's, that's an issue that not just the businesses, but also their, their customers or clients are also having to deal with. Was there any that a question? <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I'm curious. Was there any optimism out there? Was was there any? Obviously, we hear a lot about inflation, supply chain, all the things you just referenced. Are we hear about? We see in the press. Mm -hmm. Is anybody optimistic about COVID potentially winding down or anything else like that? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that's really amazing, actually, about the uh, getting to do the work that I do is that uh, I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm constantly talking to people who are optimistic. I mean, um, and I often say I'm an, I'm an optimistic person or I wouldn't have run for Congress, yeah. but I think, I mean, you can think of it that way for our entrepreneurs that are out there. You know, entrepreneurs are not just solving problems. That is of course a big piece of what they're doing, but they're also, I mean, they're doing what they can to create the, I mean, and, the, and, and then we just happen to have, uh, I'm biased, obviously, um, in the Kansas third and the Kansas City metro area, we have one of the most robust entrepreneurial ecosystems, uh, I believe, in, in the country, whether it's the, uh, you know, we've got the, the, Kauffman, the Kauffman Foundation, which has, is a national supporter of entrepreneurial pursuits. Uh, we've got our small business development centers, the Women's Business Center, um, SBDCs, um, and Women's Business Centers are certainly doing tons of work in the community. Um, and, you know, even if you look at the workforce, uh, workforce issues that some of the small businesses that I was talking to um, are facing, uh, they need more folks because they're growing because they're uh, solving problems. They're out there um, helping people get what they need in one way or another. And um, so I think that uh, the nice thing about working with entrepreneurs and small business owners and um, even folks in medium size and large businesses is that part of the reason that they know um, uh, that, uh, that we're going to be, that we're going to be good is because, you know, we've, Talk about a country full of problem solvers with grit and innovative ideas. That's like, that's the folks that we, we get a chance to work with every day. Yeah, I love that. You know, one of the things you just mentioned was women's business centers. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago now, the House just passed your bill on that, the Women's Business Centers Improvement Act. And this would allow more female entrepreneurs to access technical and financial and all sorts of training at women's business centers across the country. And, and I'm just curious, what inspired you to, to hone in on that and tackle this specific issue? Um, you know, it's interesting that the, so first of all, the SBA has, uh, so I sit on the small business committee and the SBA has a number of, uh, and has had a number of really great programs for a long time. Um, you know, and then of course, with the pandemic, you, we saw the implementation of new programs like the Paycheck Protection Program and that sort of thing. But um, some of these programs, like the Women's Business Center program, have, uh, I mean, they just have so much success under their belt. Mm -hmm. They have helped companies across the board. Uh, and, and, you know, I did a, a round table at the women's business, the Kansas women's business center, uh, which is located in the Kansas third, but it actually serves the entire state and also the, um, the Missouri side of the Kansas city metro area. And like the number of clients that they have been able to help the number of, of businesses that they've been able to help, um, either get started or take that next, uh, leap to grow um, is like, when you see the statistics about how many people they've helped, you know that this is a good program and it needs to be supported. Um, and I actually uh, introduced a bill in the last Congress. Um, and then in this Congress, we were able to get it passed. Um, and, you know, increasing the authorization for the women's business centers is going to, uh, is, is going to give the women's business centers a broader reach so they can help um, even more entrepreneurs. 
Uh, also, increase the the overall increase will go to increasing individual um, individual women's business center uh, grant allocations because nice. um, that actually has been the same since the program started, um, which is kind of uh, interesting. And then, uh, and then also getting an accreditation program set up so that uh, you know the women's business centers, while they're they're already providing excellent services and counseling, that um, that we make sure that uh, that that's able to continue on into the future and and uh, really get some framework and parameters around that. I love that, um, and I think I think it's very interesting that you also authored this bill with a Republican from New York, Claudia Tenney. Uh -huh. And entrepreneurship seems to be one of those issues that brings members on both sides of the aisle together. I'm curious, why do you think that is? Um, I think it happens, you know, I think that happens in places where, I think that happens in places where it's like common sense stuff, which maybe sounds a little bit cliche or something, yeah. but um, you know, when you think about uh, the innovation, the creativity, uh, passion, problem solving, um, an opportunity to start your own business, I, I do think that there's an element of that, that like, that's not about being one party or the other. That's about trying to meet the needs of your community. That's about um, being part of the economic vitality of your community and our country. And I think that a, a lot of the, the issues that we see are like when you boil them down. And when I say issues that we see, I mean, the small business committee, yeah. when you boil them down, it really is. There's a lot of uh, common sense uh, stuff that once we know the ins and outs, uh, what we really want to do is make sure that we're uh, that we're supporting the people who are employing most of the folks in the country that are um, helping us get the goods that we need. And so I think that there's, um, I, I like being on the small business committee because it feels like a place where, uh, you know, entrepreneurship absolutely transcends party lines and, um, and a lot of the ideologies and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And Look, one of the reasons we're here today is to talk about the Small Business Committee and all of these issues. But as Amani said, we're really focused on today and through the Alliance, helping more women and people of color specifically be successful mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. And, I'm, and I wanted to talk to you about this because your district is so unique. It's obviously very purple. Um, and I love your advice on how you talk about equity issues because it can be different and difficult in certain places especially when there's lots of people struggling and not just one community or another, but you seem to balance talking about equity and inclusion so well, like, how do you do it? What, what advice do you have for others who are trying to help the most vulnerable in our economy, but then also don't want to forget about others? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. You know, I think that, well, first I, I think I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> uh, the federal government often takes this kind of like cookie cutter approach to things and, uh, or like one size fits all or whatever kind of analogy we want to use. And I, I, I just like fundamentally don't agree with, um, with, that, with that as a concept. You know, every single one of our, uh, you know, as a federal representative, my district is different than uh, even the other districts in the state of Kansas, you know, and um, so all of us have uh, our distinct communities that we're that we're trying to figure out the best way to represent. And I think that the key to, to doing that well and to talking about the issues that are you know, facing our most vulnerable communities that are facing, uh, that, that were exacerbated, you know, there's so many issues that were exacerbated by the pandemic. I think um, the first step is to listen to folks and, and try to figure out what the crux of, of the concerns are. 
and and figuring out ways that we can that we can connect the dots um, in a way that's going to help as many people as possible. Mm. And when I say that, I think you know, I I I I really fundamentally fundamentally believe in 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 the Kansas third from my conversations with folks. People want things to be fair, and um, and I think that when we talk about equity. We're, we're talking about fairness and that, you know, people can recognize um, that barriers exist uh, for a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. And the more of those we can break down, the better it is for everybody. And I think that um, the first step to really being able to have a good conversation about the need to uh, make uh, access more equitable, to make and that's access to uh, clients, that's access to funding, that you know, access to capital is a huge issue. And I think making sure that folks know that, um, that I'm not putting anybody into a specific box, but rather that I'm, I'm listening and trying to figure out how to avoid the cookie cutter problem. So important, please keep doing it. Please talk to more of your, yeah. your friends and colleagues on the Hill. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit because I know you're on the conference committee for what could be one of the biggest bills that Congress passes this year, but that's not the only thing you guys have done over this Congress. You've had the bipartisan infrastructure bill, you've had American Rescue Plan. Congress has done a lot, so that's good. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns I get kind of as folks hear about that comes from small businesses wondering how they're gonna be able to tap into these government resources. Mm -hmm. And as you know, business owners of color are not widely represented among those who win contracts to supply governments and hospitals and schools and all these contracts. And, you know, I think the latest data shows that minority owned small businesses receive something like less than 10% of federal contract dollars. Women receive even less. And, you know, from your perch on the small business committee and talking to folks throughout Kansas third, why do you think these communities are overlooked when it comes to contract dollars? Sorry. No worries. It's not a Zoom event unless somebody forgets to unmute. Yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I think that there's a couple of, um, so this is an issue that was important to me even before I got to Congress, uh, which is part of why I was excited to both be on small business, but then specifically on the subcommittee uh, for economic growth, tax and capital access. It's a long name, but, um, uh, but that idea of, of economic growth, of capital access, is um, it's totally tied into what you're talking about with these government, uh, you know, whether it's the procurement process for the federal government or the state government or whatever. I think that uh, what we saw with with the second iteration of the Paycheck Protection Program, when we made sure that you know that smaller banks, community development financial institutions, minority deposit institutions that um, that those uh, types of institutions that are much more uh, integrated into and familiar with and have relationships with um, with folks across the board uh, in sometimes in more vulnerable communities, um, sometimes in those communities that are traditionally uh, left out of, of the process. Um, so that's that's one piece. Um, and then, I think that making sure that we're thinking about the contracting in a much bigger picture than just on small business. Hmm. So I'm thinking about the ways that in transportation and infrastructure um, and on the bipartisan infrastructure bill on this, um, you know, I'm on the conference committee where we're going to try to work on the domestic manufacturing and supply chain issues that we're seeing is, is making sure too that folks know about the, the different projects and funding that's going to come out of those. So um, when you were asking the question, one of the things I was thinking about is, because I don't know if it's happened yet or not, but our office is putting on uh, workshops to help folks so that they know 
um, what grant opportunities are out there. We're doing things trying to make sure that we're connecting folks with, you know, like the Kansas Manufacturing Solutions, which is like a, a public-private partnership um, under NHTSA. And like they're helping connect small businesses to uh, to the to to various um, government opportunities and that sort of thing. So I think it's a combination of making sure that access is there, that we're supporting entrepreneurs, and then also making sure that we're making the the end result with the from the federal perspective of whether it's contracting or programs that we're making sure that people know about them and that that they're accessible um, and understandable. Yeah, this access, but then the awareness piece, we can't right. forget. Yeah. So important. Yeah. Um, I don't want to leave without spending a minute just specifically talking about tribal communities. Mm. Um, and I know you've got to leave us here in a sec, but you know, when we think about help, better helping entrepreneurs in the tribal community, those on reservations and not, you know, any parting thoughts about how this community of advocates and academics and civil rights leaders, how we can be thinking about entrepreneurs specifically in the tribal community, what we can do to help? Um, yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one is that, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm working on is to make sure that you know, in the SBA, there's the Office of Native American Affairs trying to empower, trying to empower that uh, office, make sure that there's a robust, um, that, that they have the ability to deliver on the mission. Um, and uh, right now, there's not uh, explicit funding uh, for that specific office. And, you know, the um, administrator has to set the direction and this sort of thing. And I, I want to make sure that, that that type of office has the resources and um, uh, uh, is just empowered to do the work in Native communities. And then I think that the other piece is, it goes back to listening, you know, making sure that as we're developing out programs, as we're working on, you know, and this this can be true, not just from the federal perspective, but anybody who's doing like entrepreneurship work in their in um, in their communities is like, I think that one of the superpowers I'm getting there, one of the superpowers that comes out of like being the only person like you in the room uh, in a lot of different circumstances over the years, like one of the superpowers that can come out of that is being able to look around and recognize like, wait, did we reach out to and invite people who have not been in this room before? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's one thing that, uh, we can do from the federal perspective, but it's something that all of us can be working on. And I think that, for native communities, particularly, um, there's there's an element. There's often an element of just uh, it it doesn't it doesn't come to mind to reach out to native communities or native entrepreneurs, um, not out of any malice, but because um, like the structure of the way that that things are set up right now. Um, and I think that that's an that's an important thing that we can that we can all do uh, do better on. It's a great parting thought on that. Uh, listen, I always learn so much. I would love to keep you for another hour, but we can't. I know you have conference committees to get to and we have another um, panel to get yeah. to, but uh, just on behalf of everyone at Third Way and the National Urban League and all of our partners, thank you. Thank you for being here and for all your wisdom today. And we're looking forward to working with you in the coming weeks and coming months. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for covering, um, thanks for you know, covering these topics with, uh, with conversations and that sort of thing. Cause this is, uh, I hope that, I hope that we're all taking something away from these conversations. I know I, I know I am. Me too. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Amani Augustus. And I would ask our other panelists, um, if they could just turn their cameras on and Amani over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Great. Thanks so much, Dave. And thank you to Congresswoman Davids um, again for that conversation and just the wonderful insights that she brings um, as a member who's such a good um, advocate on these issues. 
Um, it is now with great pleasure that I get to introduce three women who will join me for a conversation about how to build um, a modern entrepreneurship agenda. So first up is Zamara Pena. She is the Vice President of Engagement at the Small Business Majority. Zamara drives the organization's external engagement efforts toward a more inclusive and equitable economy that directly benefits entrepreneurs in underserved communities. Alongside the organization's small business engagement team, she works collaboratively on strengthening relationships with policymakers, small business owners, and organizations across the country to amplify their equity lens in all areas of the organization's work. Samara has extensive experience supporting small businesses, particularly those run by people of color, women, and immigrants. And prior to joining the Small Business Majority, Samara piloted business retention programs for the city of Los Angeles. Um, these programs were geared towards empowering at risk youth, and she also has extensive experience as a business owner, community organizer, and campaign manager. Thanks, Samara, for being here. Next, um, we are joined by Kim Lane, the Chief Operating Officer at Right to Start. Kim is an award-winning business owner with experience leading strategy and operations for Fortune 500 companies and the nation's leading foundations. As COO of Right to Start, which is an entrepreneurial policy startup um, that is making entrepreneurial opportunity a public priority by changing minds, policies, and communities. She also owns a strategic consulting company and serves as a regional director for the Kauffman Foundation's One Million Cups program and um, a strategy and operations consultant for Meta. She is also a senior advisor to the Global Entrepreneurship Network, where she supports startup, startup communities worldwide. And finally, I am honored to introduce uh, Sheila Mixon. Ms. Mixon is Senior Vice President of the Business Development and Entrepreneurship Department for the an uh, Urban League of Greater Southwestern Ohio, where she provides vision, leadership, and organizational governance. Um, she also serves as the Executive Director for the Women's Business Entrepreneurship Council of the Ohio River Valley. Ms. Mixon has 41 years in business development experience, the financial services industry, and not-for-profit organizations. She sits on a number of boards and advisory committees focused on businesses and economic inclusion, including a recent appointment to the Cincinnati Academic Center um, Advisory Committee for Union Institute and University and the Cleveland Clinic Supplier Diversity Advisory Council. Thank you all so much, ladies, for joining me this morning. Um, so I wanna start our conversation um, kind of where Gabe and Congresswoman David left off. Um, you know, part of the reason Third Way and the Urban League have launched the Alliance is to fill this information gap that policymakers seem to have in regard to the unique barriers that women and minorities face as entrepreneurs. Um, I think we all remember uh, far too well the difficulty that small businesses and particularly communities of color had um, in the early stages of the pandemic with the rollout of the Paycheck Protection Program. And a study by the Federal Reserve found that some of this was due to minority businesses not having long established relationships with banks. So my question, my first question for you is, what do you think are one or two issues that women owned and minority owned businesses face that don't necessarily get enough attention here in Washington? Um. I guess I can start. Um, and thank you, Amani, for um, inviting me to participate uh, on this panel discussion. Um, a couple things. Uh, the biggest issue that has already been addressed is access to capital. And you're exactly right. Um, minority and women owned businesses did not receive their fair share of those PPP funds, right? Uh, that was available to them. The second round was a little better, but um, finding the right, I think one of the biggest things that we have to do as advocates is find those lending institutions that are small business friendly. And sometimes that's not the big banks. So, and I can speak to that because I call myself a recovering banker, been in recovery uh, 30 years, will not 
relapse, but knowing that my relationships that were established were established with the um, credit unions and the community banks because they are more uh, small business friendly. And then educating our business owners about what they need to do to establish a good relationship with their lending institution. You can get away from the big banks and, and, and get as much, if not more, uh, support from those community lenders, those community banks. And it's about establishing those relationships and spending time to get to know their bankers so that the bankers know them. I think uh, one other thing um, that's, um, that I think is, is important to understand is that when you walk into a room, a minority or woman-owned business walks into a room and a networking event, oftentimes, more oftentimes than not, they're the only woman or woman of color or minority that's in that room in a room full of uh, white males. And that can be daunting. So we spend a lot of our time when we know that those opportunities are uh, uh, becoming available to them is to work with them around how they enter the room, how they present themselves and the right questions to go into that room so that, so that they are comfortable because it's not a comfortable thing. This is what we deal with every day. I'm happy to jump in here next, um, Ziamara Pena with Small Business Majority. And again, thank you guys for such a robust discussion already. If God, I've been thinking, uh, I had a few thoughts initially, and there are a few things that Representative Davids mentioned that I think uh, worth are worth uh, spending a little bit of extra time. And on the capital piece, I would say one of the pieces that is really important to consider is the need for an expanded truth and lending legislation that um, protects small business owners from predatory lenders. We know that women are unfairly, women and minority small businesses are unfairly targeted by predatory lenders because they receive lower capital compared to their male counterparts um, and, um, and counterparts in general, despite the fact that they apply at similar rates. And so with the Truth in Lending Act, there have been several efforts to make some expansions at the federal level. There's been some state efforts that have been successful, but we still don't see a national protection in place for small business owners on this on this specific issue. And again, we think about the wealth that this these practices extract from our uh, small business communities, and it's quite frankly a a big issue. And the other piece that I would I would mention that if we want to continue to support women business owners, and if we want to continue to support minority small business owners to be able to start and launch and grow their small businesses, we need to recognize that they also need to be equipped with the right tools to do so. And this includes the ability to access uh, benefits that provide affordable childcare, uh, family planning and retirement services. And there are several different at the federal level uh, efforts to make sure that, that we can address each one of these issues individually, but holistically all of these issues really help raise the floor for small business owners that um, are faced by, are typically fall into this marginalization. Yeah, that's a great point. Kim, I wonder if you have anything to add to that question. Definitely, yes, and um, echoing the thanks. This is a great conversation. Thank you so much for having us here. Right to Start does a lot of work in local communities, particularly underserved communities. So we actually hire advocates in underserved communities around the nation. And those advocates work with entrepreneurs in those communities to understand their specific barriers. So we learn a lot of amazing you know, stories and unique challenges faced by those communities. Just to, for instance, I was actually in Arkansas this week with entrepreneurs from the Latinx and Hispanic community. We were just learning about the barriers they face. And I think in these conversations, it can feel a bit like boiling the ocean. Like these are massive systemic barriers. Where do we begin to start to solve these? But often it can also be very simple, like access to the right information, access to technical assistance, to um, the know-how to start a QuickBooks account, for instance. So with the PPP um, situation, we saw that many entrepreneurs were not even eligible because they didn't have the right accounting in place, not even like a Google Sheet document with the profit and loss statement, right? So some things are really simple, like 
get get your finances in order, get the infrastructure right when you start the business. And then sometimes it's much bigger. So just to, for instance, this week in Arkansas, many of the entrepreneurs were just voicing the weight of the regulatory procedures that they needed to go through to even start their business. And I'm going to quickly reference an Institute of Justice report that came out, which highlighted some of those barriers across the nation. In Atlanta alone, it takes 76 steps to open a restaurant, 46 steps to open a bookstore, and 68 steps to open a barber shop. So, you know, this week, the entrepreneurs were echoing that exact sentiment where it was like, I wanted to open a food truck. I would jump through this hoop. I thought I was finished. Then it was this one, this one, this one. Eight months later, you know, I had this debt. I had zero customers. I couldn't open the storefront. One even said, like, at the very end, I thought I was finished. And they said, no, you need to add this one clause to the sign on your door. And you can't open until you do that. And so many, like the Marshallese community in Arkansas said, there is not one Marshallese restaurant in Arkansas because the regulatory process is just too cumbersome. So I think there are like big, big problems to solve. Like how do we minimize those barriers? And then there are small ones. Like how do we build the right infrastructure to help entrepreneurs just get started? Yeah, I'll go ahead, Chief. I have add one more thing, Imani, that I wanna make sure that we mention. When, when the conversations are happening, I think what needs to be, um, the, what's important is that you have to meet the business owners where they are and the needs of a business that's less than a million dollars is totally different from the needs of someone that's a half a billion dollars. So having separate conversations with the various um, uh, revenue categories, I think is important so that they can get the full picture because if you do, if they're meeting with, and I know when you're having these conversations, when conversations are being had with business owners, it's not those that are at the uh, less than a million dollars. And it's important to hear what they are going through, what their concerns and challenges are, as well as what's happening in the middle markets and those at the higher um, uh, revenue category uh, businesses as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I wonder what um, others have to say about this too, because I know each of your organizations in different ways has a grassroots kind of network of small businesses, community leaders, advocates, and policymakers um, that inform your work and also share the stories about what needs actually exist for different um, segments of of businesses in different parts of the life cycle. Um, how, how do you use that um, conversation or that surveying of businesses right where they're at, hearing from them, hearing the stories and the needs they have to um, build your agenda for what change really has to be accomplished? Um, like you said, Sheila, you can't really um, know what to change unless you hear it directly from, from folks. Totally. I can jump in quickly. A, a quick um, plus one to Sheila too. Um, the meeting entrepreneurs where they are is something that we have heard voiced a lot from our local advocates and entrepreneurs. And even we hear it from like, we're working communities that are robust entrepreneurially, lots of entrepreneurial support organizations, capital access, but we have um, underserved entrepreneurs saying, they don't have access to technical assistance. And then when, when the advocates say, well, what about these organizations? They're like, I didn't know those existed. Like, I don't go to the accelerator. I don't go to the maker space. And so how would I know those existed? So I think being super intentional in order to level the playing field, you have to go where people are, go where the communities are. Like we've heard like, why don't you go to, the, to our local restaurants and grocery stores and churches to talk about these resources or else, um, you know, just to put a flag up and say we have a DEI lens doesn't mean that people will will come there. You know, you have to be super intentional. And then in terms of, of some of the barriers that we've seen, we actually have this sort of beautiful um, success story that was completely led by the people on the ground, not led by right to start, you know, at the HQ level. So we had one of our advocates, it was actually her very first year of being an advocate. And she realized several of the businesses she met with said they didn't even start their business because the licensing fee was too high. So she, our advocate, Damara Baker, came to us, came to our policy team and said, what can we do about this? We sat together and sort of drafted a policy recommendation. And, and she ended up getting nominated to the city of Fayetteville's Economic Vitality Steering Committee. So on her own accord, she got nominated to this committee. 
on the committee, she said, um, I want to make a recommendation that the city of Fayetteville waives the business licensing fee for businesses in their first year. That way, they're not strapped by these fees early on. It can kind of give them some runway. And the city adopted their policy into their five-year strategic plan. It's not finalized yet. Um, it's still in its draft stages. But I think it's just such a great example of Really, it just took someone saying, this is a problem local people are facing. Here's a solution. And the city was like, we love it. Let's let's adopt this. So I think, you know, there are there are barriers that exist that we don't see at our level. There are barriers that people on the ground who are hyper local see every single day. And if we're able to empower people on the ground to sort of make recommendations to solve those barriers, I think we can make, you know, you can see the incremental changes that occur. It's like, okay, well, what if we're able to do that? in cities in every state across the nation. Think of all the barriers that can come down. And then for us at Right to Start, those, those small successes, which are big successes for the local entrepreneurs, those inform our, our federal agendas as well. So we're like, okay, well, this is something that worked at the local level. We can share that with our federal policymakers. And here's how we can sort of mirror that language into a potential federal Right to Start Act or something like that. Um, at Small Business Majority, we network, uh, we, we survey our network of about 85,000 small business owners every other month to get a pulse of what are those issues that are impacting them, whether it's inflation, whether it's workforce shortages. Uh, of course, during the pandemic, this was incredibly invaluable. I think we were doing surveys every every month. Um, and this was extremely helpful data for us to be able to make timely recommendations uh, to policymakers in real time of the changes and the pain points that small business owners were experiencing. So the surveys, I think, are a great way to be able to collect uh, data from small business owners. But again, we may not be able to collect data from all of the representative small business communities that we'd like to see at the table. And so what we've also done is we establish uh, councils of small business owners. We have a national small business owner council. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis. In addition, we have state councils in a couple of our, uh, our states where we have offices. Again, those meet on a monthly basis every month consistently to get feedback directly from small business owners on the issues that are impacting them. And that feedback actually informs our work. And so it's not just a one-way street here we're reporting out and telling you what we're doing on the hill and <clears throat> about our work on research and programs it, it's really it's really us being able to as as organizations again listen to the folks on the ground and adapt our programs and recommendations based on the needs rather than based on the assertions that we have around the solutions that that should be uh, addressed and i think that it's incredibly powerful to establish those peer networks as well for small business owners to be able to be in community with other small business owners that also are reflective of, of themselves. And that's, that's an incredibly important piece of being able to build grassroots advocacy from the uh, bottom up approach. Sheila, I, yeah, I wanted to actually pass it to you to see, I know that the Urban League does survey of their new constituency and that informs the programs that you all offer. Did you want to add anything to how that kind of plays out for you in your region? Uh, yes, um, we, we, we rely on surveying uh, tremendously because that helps us set the programming. Um, you know, the, uh, our minority work is done, is handled through our Economic Empowerment Center, which is funded by the National Urban League. So we are one of 12 entrepreneurship centers that, um, that works with minority clients around the country. I mean, around within the uh, greater Southwestern Ohio. So we've been able to um, uh, initiate a lot of programming based on the conversations that have come from the surveys that we've done. Um, I'm proud to say that the, we just, um, we're part of a larger group called the Lincoln Gilbert, Lincoln and Gilbert Initiative, where it's a collaboration of service providers here in the Cincinnati area that spans from organizations, advocates that are working with those companies that are in the ideation phase to those that are over a uh, million dollars and want to scale more, right? And everything in between. And, and which is 
pretty unprecedented um, in this day and age, because as I travel, travel a lot, we have five organizations that work extremely well together. And we've been working together since 2009, right? Now it's more formalized because we've gotten the funding to be able to do the work that needs to be done. Right. And so we know how to refer the clients from one organization to the next to help them grow along the way and to address the needs and challenges that they have. And Lincoln and Gilbert is a, is a five year initiative where we hope to double the number of minority businesses in in the city of uh, Cincinnati. So with that. Of course, we're looking for fu additional funding that can help support and do more right? Not just within the city of Cincinnati, but in the county and covering the, um, uh, the territory that, uh, that we have in Southwest Ohio. So that's going to come from federal funding. So being able to build the case and show the results of what we're doing locally through the Lincoln and Gilbert, Gilbert initiative will help, will go a long way towards us addressing the needs that have come out of the surveys that we've done. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I, I really enjoy hearing about, I, I, I know that the SBA thinks about this too, of the organizations that are in the communities themselves and how they can play that connective role mm -hmm. um, and help inform entrepreneurs and business owners of what resources are available to them, but making sure that those um, community navigators are themselves have the resources they need to be able to put on this program. And I think right. it's a really great point. Um, so I know Kim and Zamara, your two organizations place an emphasis on changing policies. And Kim, I really enjoyed hearing about um, your partner who was able to incorporate that idea into um, her local kind of economic development plan and, and the community taking that on. Um, I'm wondering what kind of policies do you think can find support at the federal level and in the states? Um, and what you know doesn't seem to have support now, but you would nonetheless like to see happen um, to expand opportunities for, for entrepreneurs? Totally, happy to dive in there. Um, right to Start actually has a whole field guide for policymakers and we have it split up between local, state and federal. So we do have a whole list of federal um, pro entrepreneur policies, but just a few of those. We talked about government contracting earlier. It is so huge, such an unlevel playing field right now. We recommend dedicating 5% of government contracts to new companies just to give them that runway again to start, you know, the relationships and networks are so historic that it is it is just an uneven playing field so if there was a way to just say like look five percent of these new contracts will go to new companies then at least they have more of a fair shot um another is healthcare mobility providing um portable health care benefits for workers in transition we hear that all the time right i can't start my company because um I, I won't have any benefits and so what do i do in the interim so if there's a way to just uh you know eliminate that barrier as well and then just the tax hassles, you know, this is also so huge for new businesses. Um, I know as a small business owner, it can feel like you're just like giving half of your income away at tax season. Um, so if there's a way to reduce those tax hassles by allowing businesses to defer income tax deadlines or skip deadlines, for instance, if their net income is less than $5,000 a year or something like that. So we do have a lot of these sort of like bite size pro entrepreneur policies, and they do go all the way down um, to the local level as well. But there are, um, you know, there are there are steps we can take that would make a drastic difference in the lives of small business owners. Yeah, and I think, Kim, you've referenced a lot of the issue areas that I think our organization also focuses on tax policy, um, health care, I think I mentioned benefits, uh, procurement is a growing space here. Um, it is incredibly, I thought we were close uh, to implementing a policy that would help uh, more working parents afford childcare. And, and we know that at the federal level, again, this is in incredibly important. We've seen some investments by states, but we still need to have that federal infrastructure in place. 
both for childcare and for paid uh, family leave programs. And there's wide support from the small business community on these investments. I think another area uh, that we've seen a lot of movement on is around secure choice uh, legislations that provide access to uh, retirement savings uh, programs for small business owners and, and those employees that work at small businesses that may not offer retirement savings plans. Again, we've seen states mobilize or activate these bills in their states, um, but there is no federal infrastructure really in place for um, a secure choice bill at the federal level. And so while we, we're seeing, we're really grateful to see that movement on the state level, we know that there are many small business owners that are simply left out because they're not in a state that is actually working to implement some, some kind of uh, secure choice law to address this gap. And then again, I think uh, we, we reiterated the importance of procurement. It's not just a matter of saying we have, a, we have expanded our goal so that our goal is now 10%, but the accountability must follow suit. And so even with the federal, um, even with the uh, president's executive order increasing our federal procurement rules, it's important that we can actually ensure that there is accountability within the departments uh, to ensure that those dollars are making their way down. Um, and I think we've started to see some movement on corporate accountability because a lot of uh, corporations have also indicated that they're revisiting um, their procurement and supplier diversity programs. Um, and so the same should be said with our state and local governments. We're huge purchasers and we have the power to actually move the needle for small and minority owned businesses through these programs. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. Um, and Sheila, I, I wanted to make sure that we give you an opportunity to tell us more about your work um, as executive director of the Women's Business Enterprise Council. Zamaro spoke about um, some of the unique barriers that I think are uniquely challenging for women. She mentioned benefits and healthcare and childcare and things like that. Um, we earlier we heard Representative Davids talk about the importance of women-owned businesses and the need to better equip them. Um, I'm wondering what you think the com what kind of competitive edge do women-owned businesses have? And how do we funnel more women of diverse backgrounds um, into long-term success um, as, as entrepreneurs? Um, through um, the Women's Business Enterprise Council, Ohio River Valley, we are one of 14 regional partnering organizations that certify women-owned businesses that are 51% owned, operated and controlled by a woman. And of course, that gives them access to procurement opportunities, both on the public and private sector um, area, because we, we are one of the certifying entities for the federal government's uh, women-owned small business program, right? So they set aside 5% of federal, federal uh, dollars budget for procurement opportunities for women-owned businesses. So the certification is one of the growth strategies that a woman-owned business can have, right? But it's not just about the procurement with the corporations or even the federal government to a certain extent, because the chances of them getting a direct contract is really slim and none. But what they can do and what we advocate to do is identifying who the tier one suppliers are to those corporations. And sometimes you go in as a tier two, tier three, sometimes tier four, because money is green, right? The money is green. It gives them an opportunity, and uh, Zamara said it, we have to be accountable. So when you get your foot in the door, you have to be able to be perform the work because that gets you noticed and gets you an opportunity to be able to move from a tier two to a, from a tier four to a tier three and so forth and so on. So we work, uh, we work uh, really hard to get our WBEs to understand, and particularly our women of color, because we do have a woman of color initiative and, and to grow more African-American businesses to, um, 
to to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there from the procurement perspective, right? But we have to make sure that they're sustainable. So we put programming together based on surveys on what they say they need to help get them prepared for those opportunities. And we encourage the B2B opportunities because if, you, if you're able to do um, business to business, that helps you build your capacity as well. And, and those procurement opportunities will come about because you're able to build your capacity based on um, uh, being able to uh, do business with one another. So the programming is out there. We just have to make sure that we're diligent and, and staying on top of what they say their needs are and not try to second guess what their needs are. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I want to, um, I know we are running out of time here, but I wanted to send one last question over to you. Um, and as we've kind of been talking here today and heard Gabe and um, the representative talking as well, some might be listening and watching later and wonder, well, so what? Uh, you know, 6% of Hispanic Americans own employer businesses in the US, only 2% of Black Americans, men outnumber women in business ownership women of color receive hardly any venture capital. What's the big deal, some might say. So my final um, last and final question for you all would be what, what is the significance of closing this gap? And why is it important to ensure the opportunity to build a successful and enduring business um, in this country is extended as broadly as possible? And I was hoping we could start with Kim. Totally, I mean, yeah, I mean, the data is all there. We act, we know that the majority of net new jobs come from new businesses, not old ones. Um, I think this was in the, the, the AEE report this week that Black entrepreneurs have 12 times more net worth than their peers who work for an employer. We know that entrepreneurs' incomes are higher than people working traditional jobs. Um, entrepreneurship creates new companies, creates new jobs in the economy, increases net worth. Like, it makes total sense. Um, but the nation is in a startup slump. So um, the rate of people starting businesses is decreasing. 69% of entrepreneurs say the government doesn't care about them. They feel like the government doesn't care about them. 41% of Americans say they would start their dream business in six months if they could, but only 2% do start their business. And we know that there are regulatory barriers keeping people from starting. So if you look at the data, it makes complete sense. We need new businesses. We need to empower entrepreneurs. We need people to feel empowered and inspired to go. Um, just to piggyback on what Sheila was saying, it's like the programs exist. How do we connect them to the programs? How do we close the gap between entrepreneurs and policymakers? How do we connect the grassroots and the grass tops as we say it right to start? And I think that's the, the why is we need this. We need to level the playing field. It makes sense for everybody. I think everyone can get behind job creation and, and higher net worth. Um, and I think it's just a matter of the how, which is, you know, reducing these regulatory barriers, making sure we're listening to entrepreneurs on the ground and just really being very intentional to make sure that we're closing these gaps for entrepreneurs. Thank you. Samara? Yeah, I want to just echo again, small business is small business ownership and entrepreneurship is a proven pathway to building, um, it, building income, uh, building independence, building financial security for business owners, for themselves, for their families, and for their employees. And so again, and we also know that businesses owned by people of color and women tend to hire folks from their respective communities. And so it's, it is really about empowering communities. And it's not just about helping that one business owner to start that business, but when that business owner is able to hire somebody, the likelihood that they are able to hire someone from that's reflective of their community is extremely high. The research stands behind this thing, something like 65 or 70% of business owners who are likely to hire, who are of color, are likely to hire staff that are also of color. And so we're talking about an expanded, um, and a, a ripple effect, if you will, of, of, of access and opportunity and income generation. And that is the key, that is, that is the key. And, and so when we're talking about affecting policies all the way through implementation, it's important to keep in mind, again, the, the impact of the, of the whole. And so looking at it from a holistic 
viewpoint is what will help us continue to move the needle and help level the playing field for our small business owners. Yeah, and Sheila, did you have any last words? Um, yes, I think um, uh, I echo everything that Kim and um, Samara has uh, stated because it is absolutely the truth about being able to hire from within your community and minority and women-owned businesses are more philanthropic when they have the ability to do so, which helps the community at large. Um, I think the biggest thing that I would like to see happen, and we don't have a lot of them in the country, but finding more venture capitalists that are, that are women-led or minority-led so that the funds are available to them because they understand the struggles. And so trying to identify those, those organizations, those companies that can do that, um, I would like to see that made a little easier for us as advocates to find those, find those things. Yes, we can provide grants and part of what Lincoln and Gilbert will be doing is providing grants, but grants is just a stopgap, right? We have to make sure that they are prepared for the lending process. And so we, we have to step in, make sure that they understand um, and, 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 uh, understand that you don't have to do payday loans anymore or you run your credit cards up anymore because that creates um, uh, credit issues for you. So education is at the crux of all of this and this education for the entrepreneurs and education for the advocates and it's education for the policymakers. So it has to be a three-legged stool. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly right. There has to be this entire ecosystem of support from the capital, from the ability to get that first client, that first customer in procurement to the benefits that need to be in place um, in order to have success to that network of support um, and mentorship that's available to support a business owner. I think all of these are things that, um, you know, AEE and all of you are definitely going to be um, continuing to fight for and working toward. And Samara, I, I just love what you said about this kind of ripple effect or, or multiplier effect that we really have um, an opportunity to capture on the table here. Um, so I just want to thank you, send a thank you to our experts for joining us today and for Congresswoman Davids as well for being with us this morning. Um, I know our audience um, has taken away many, many takeaways from this conversation. Um, if you all are interested in keeping up with the Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity, I hope you'll um, head over to Twitter and follow us at AE Equity and sign up to receive updates from us at aeequity.org. Um, thank you so much. Hope you guys have a great afternoon.